So I'm here with Matt Ashton today. He's a counseling psychologist. He did his graduate work at Texas Tech University. He's been a staff psychologist at the University of Kentucky, um, also here at Idaho State University. And I'm excited to chat with him more about his experience working with individuals who struggle with pornography. Um, but he's also an ex expert in acceptance and commitment therapy. That's the same framework or approach we use in the Life After Pornography program. Um, so I'm excited to learn a little bit more from Matt. Um, we have both did our internships at Brigham Young University's Counseling Center and have facilitated some full-day training workshops for counselors and psychologists to learn more about ACT. So Matt, I'm kind of curious to hear a little bit more about your background. So I didn't really work with people who struggled with porn until I was at BYU. And that was kind of my first experiences working with ACT. But tell me about like your background, how you got into acceptance and commitment therapy, and also working with sexual concerns. Yeah, I first uh, came across uh, acceptance and commitment therapy really in graduate school. I'd heard about it, the name, as an undergrad. Um, so I did my undergrad at BYU. Um, met a couple of the counselors uh, there. So I'd heard about it, but in graduate school I came to really know it. Um, and it really, uh, stood out to me as a unique uh, form of treatment, as a way to really allow people to pursue what really matters in their life. And that was something that was unique in uh, different therapy uh, treatments. And so I really kind of gravitated to that values piece. Um, and so I really gave direction for uh, helping people with where they wanted to go. They get to choose the direction based on their values. Mm -hmm. And ACT was just a wonderful framework to be able to do that. So I really got to know it and really uh, learned it a lot on my internship at BYU. I uh, kind of honed my skills there. Um, and then uh, ever since then, that's been my main mode of doing treatment for lots of different concerns people come in. Hmm. So pornography, I do a lot with anxiety, um, depression. Um, a lot of people are struggling with just different life concerns. ACT really gives a really good framework to treat yeah. all of those things. So we have that similar background where we don't just specialize in working with pornography or for sexual concerns. Um, I call myself a generalist. You probably would uh, say the same call thing. yourself a generalist yeah. too. So ACT has been around for decades and is effective in treating anxiety and depression as well as compulsive behaviors. Um, but it's not just for pornography. It's for overall mental health. And it's. I think what I appreciate about it as well is it's, it's focused a lot more on values and creating a life you want instead of just focusing on kind of struggle with symptoms, be it anxiety or depression or Absolutely. It really fits for whatever concerns are present in our lives. It's really about living life the way we want to. Yeah. So it gives that direction in how to put all the pieces together to make that happen. So whatever the concerns are, ACT fits really, really well. Yeah. All those things. That's kind of where you got your roots in ACT. When did you start working with individuals that said, hey, I'm, I'm a porn addict or I've got struggles with porn? Um, I actually... Uh, I saw a few uh, students uh, as a graduate student. Um, I worked in the Student Counseling Center at Texas Tech University. Saw a couple of students there. Um, when I, I wasn't as familiar with the treatment protocol with ACT at that point, so that was, it was new, but I, I was really excited to work with that. And then um, uh, as an intern at BYU, um, got to participate in the groups that are there just mm -hmm. as you did. Mm -hmm. Um, so really got to learn how to treat that specifically uh, there. So I, I ran four different groups over a year there uh, pretty continuously. And then um, I continued just, that's been an interest ever since mm -hmm. then. I enjoy working with individuals that struggle with that. Um, so in every place I've been, I've worked with uh, different people and it's, it's interesting no matter where I'm at, the, the, the story is the same. Really? In what way? Um, a lot of people, they come in and they say, oh, I'm a porn addict, or they can't even get it out of their mouths yeah. because they're so ashamed to work it. themselves up to <laughs> it. Like, I struggle with something. Something, and it finally comes out, and then they use that language, I'm a porn addict, and it's, and it's like, uh, okay. And, and they start to talk about it, and it's, it's the same concern. I'm, I'm viewing porn on a semi or regular basis, mm -hmm. And I don't want to be. Yeah. And I believe that it's wrong, that it's bad. And this is coming from people for, from a variety of different religious traditions. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I worked with a devout Catholic, same concern. 
uh, worked with a lot of uh, Latter-day Saints, um, worked with you know, other different Christian uh, uh, backgrounds that students have, and the story is pretty much the same. I'm doing something that I don't want to be doing, that I don't believe in, doesn't fit with my values, I don't want to change it. Hmm. And so um, ACT gives us then a place to start from and kind of move forward. Yeah. You have so been in different regions that. of the country. You've been in Texas, in Texas, Utah, Kentucky, Idaho, Kentucky, and now I'm in Idaho. And yeah, it's it's interesting that people raise this exact same concerns regardless of their background. Yeah. And I know, like BYU is a religious institution, and you mentioned several of the folks that struggle also had a religious background. What role do you think religion plays in contributing or helping people who identify having a problem with pornography? Um, yeah, I see, you know, people that aren't religious don't seem to be as concerned with pornography. Mm. And it's really that the idea that my behavior isn't matching my values, it isn't matching what I believe. And that causes a lot of dissonance, yeah. it's that distress of I'm not living my life the way I either feel I suppo I'm supposed to be or I want to be. It's like morally, this is something I don't want to right. do. Right, it's, it's something that doesn't match, and so, and so that, that disparity causes a lot of distress. And that's where the concern is. I, w I don't want to be doing this anymore. And so religion also gives the great framework for, here's how I do want to live my life. Oh. And so I think that's the positive side. A lot of people say, well, this is a religious problem. Yeah. Um, not necessarily, and that's where we see the concerns the most with this, but it really, religion gives the framework where here's how I do want to live my life. And so that gives us, again, a direction to go in, which I think is really positive, really yeah. helpful that people know what they're shooting for. So it gives them a sense of direction yeah. and where they want to go. I like that. So religion's a factor, and for some people, maybe the messages they've heard around sexuality or maybe lack of education around sexuality may have contributed to the challenge, but it's also the solution. It's like, there's a lot of really meaningful things in people's yeah. religious belief systems. It's a helpful. big part of their life, and the fact that I'm doing something that doesn't match that, that's where the distress that's is from. Challenge. And so that's where we could kind of work with, well, what do we want to change, and what do we want to make, that it's more in line with the life that you want to live. Yeah. That's where we go. So then what do you do with, because <clears throat> I agree with you, where it's like, Often people, the reason why they're struggling with compulsively viewing pornography it has a lot to do with beliefs they've had and emotions they have about themselves. But often people come in and say, no, I'm, it's just I'm an addict. Like, there's nothing I can do. It's, it's an addiction. And in my mind, it's like, well, actually, there's a, there's a lot of emotional parts and religious belief parts. So what do you do with that where maybe how you view it may be different than your person coming in and saying, no, I'm just an addict? Yeah, I, I, I find that people struggle the most when they hold tight to that identity piece of, I'm an addict, mm. you know, I'm addicted to pornography, it's, it's, it's almost like I've given up, I can't do anything, so obviously I'm an addict. It's just oh. stuck there, and so when, when people are so tied up in that, um, there's not a lot of wiggle room there, and it's hard to know what to change because I'm an addict. Huh. And so when people can start to look at it as, I struggle, with looking at pornography, and I don't want to be. Um, that that it's that gives us more leeway to start to move things, start mm -hmm. to change things. And so when people say I'm a porn addict, one of the things that I, we start very early to, to work on is let's look at this from a different perspective of maybe if you weren't an addict, how would your life be different? Mm -hmm. And what I find is that actually people their life isn't that different from what it is currently. Really? And answering that question, like, the main thing is I wouldn't be looking at porn. That's about it. Most, for the most part. Huh. There's a few things people are like, I, I wish I was, you know, more in shape or, you yeah. know, I was more diligent in fulfilling my responsibilities or whatever. Hmm. Um, but it's really actually not that different. So there's actually not a whole lot of change. And so that idea of, actually, you're pretty close, you're closer to the life you want to live than you think you are. And so addiction doesn't really uh, portray that. It says my life is wrong, it's completely off base oh. because I'm an addict. Okay. And that makes me a terrible person. And that's where 
I, that's the saddest part for me when people point to themselves of it's as there's something fundamentally wrong with me. And you feel like the term addiction implies that? I think it does. I think people get wrapped. That's where people go okay. with the idea of addiction. Uh, so I mean, not for everybody, but for some, it's a fundamental flaw in me. I'm an addict. I'm I'm doomed to be an addict forever. And it's internal. It's to me. Very much. I so. can't change. That's when it's the biggest struggle for people. Okay. As as the most despair wrapped up into a lot of people. So you mentioned a couple of emotions, like when I hear the word addict, I hear people imply like a biological or neurological process. But you bring up things like despair, or it sounds like, wow, this is a huge issue. Maybe people feel overwhelmed or hopeless. Like what role do you feel like emotions play in people struggling with pornography? I, I think my emotions are the core of the struggle. Hmm. That people are struggling with difficult emotions. Again, when they're, when they're viewing pornography and they don't want to be, there's that distress, in, in psychological terms we call that dissonance. It's yeah. not matching, there's a mismatch there. My behavior isn't matching my beliefs or my values. And that dissonance is very distressing, so and there can be a lot of frustration, there, there's certainly a lot of just general stress. Um, there can be you know, this sadness of I'm not living the life I want to be, so yeah. there's a sense of loss of who I really want to be. And those emotions are at the core of the struggle because I have to feel better. Mm -hmm. And when we get caught up in, I have to feel better, I have to get rid of these emotions because they're making my life so terrible. And it's pornography. Pornography is the problem. Once I get pornography, I'm going to feel better. I get that under control. And uh, that's what they're struggling with, is mm -hmm. to feel better. And so when someone can understand their emotions of, when you have this disparity in your life, this dissonance, you're going to feel bad. Mm. That emotion is telling you something. It's telling it's you. It's communicating that, to you. Yeah, it's a sign that the way things are going right now isn't working well for you. Mm. So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with the emotion itself. It's actually a really helpful signal saying, hey, I should change something here. Yeah. So, not something to fight with, but something to inform you about Absolutely. what's really going on. Yeah, so it's not about getting rid of the emotions, emotions aren't the problem to solve. Um, they're the signals of, hey, maybe I want to make some changes yeah. in how my life is going yeah. with the things I can control. And that's where the control becomes a central theme yeah. with this. I need to control my pornography viewing. People feel out of control. But it's really, it's the emotions that come with that that we don't have a lot of control over. Yeah. And when we try and control those, that's when that's the all cycle. kinds of new problems show up. Yeah. And so, so emotions are really a central piece of the struggle. Yeah. So you bring up something that I, I think about a lot. Like there are a lot of researchers and clinicians and even politicians that say, you know, we've got to view this as an addiction. And on the one hand, I, I appreciate that because I think they're trying to bring awareness to yeah. sexual concerns are legitimate as well. We should study that. I appreciate that. But it sounds like that comes at the cost of maybe helping someone focus on what could be more helpful in changing their behavior, and you're saying emotions. Yeah. It would be a lot more helpful to focus on than kind of viewing yourself as an addict. Absolutely. The, you know, that picture of this is an addiction, we have to, it's, that gives the picture of there's something we have to really eradicate out of you. Mm. There's an addiction in there that we need to remove. And especially when it comes to um, sexual concerns, it's really, really hard to eradicate sexual drives. It's kind of there. They're there, they come with, they're, they're normal, they're healthy, they're a good thing, they're a good part of our lives. And to say, you have an addiction to sex, mm -hmm. well that sets someone up for failure. Because you can't ever really get rid of that. Uh, not, with, not short of a really costly operation that is going to cause its own problems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that outlook and I think the other thing I think about with addiction is because I work with substance use as well, and chronic alcohol use or methamphetamine, those feel very different and very long term and addiction almost implies this is going to be a lifelong battle for you. So and, some people look at it. Yeah, and I wonder what your experience is using acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT like, is this years and years of work? Like, how quickly have you seen change with people? I've, I've seen change go rapidly for some people. Um, each, each person's life is different. And so I, I, 
I uh, I never put a number on it yeah. with my clients. Six sessions. Yeah, we're good. we don't do that. We're gonna take it. We're gonna take it a session at a time. We're gonna see because incremental change can happen in one session, hmm. and it's the changes that happen over time that make our life what we want it to be. And so when we focus on it that way, again, addiction gives us long term. You're gonna be battling this forever. Yeah. Act takes a very different perspective in saying. Let's create change now in the ways that are possible right now. And over time, we'll keep doing that, and your life will be something more like what you want it to be hmm. over time. And so, that again, I think that's a contrast to the addiction model where it's like you're always going to be struggling with addiction. Once an addict, addiction. always an addict. Yeah, and I just I don't think that's as helpful for most people. Yeah. Some people find comfort in that and that, okay, i got to stay vigilant yeah. and stay on top of that, and that's... That can be a very helpful outlook for some people. For a lot of people, especially with pornography, where again, our sex drive doesn't ever go away, yeah. it doesn't have to be a struggle either. It can be a very fulfilling part of our life. Yeah. And that's the change that can happen. It's much more of an internal change of, I could make my life what I want it to be with sexual It can arousal. coexist. It can be a part of that. Yeah. So one thing you mentioned that I just keep thinking about in my head is, and maybe why I care about this too, is I've met a lot of really good folks that struggle with pornography and, and my heart hurts because they've often heard a lot of messages that they're a terrible person or they've had relationships end. And you said you enjoy working with people who struggle with porn, where others may say, how could you enjoy working with those kind of people? Like, how would you respond to that? Like. Who are the people that you've got to know who struggle with pornography? They, are, for the most part, everybody that I've worked with, I've found to be very kind-hearted, devoted, great people. Mm. And what it is, again, that internalized sense of I'm a terrible person mm. makes them start to pull away from other people. Um, that's when people are really struggling with this. And when it does impact relationships, because I'm a terrible person, how could you ever love me? Oh. And yeah, that's so, it is, it's heartbreaking. And I think that's one of the most challenging pieces for me to watch that, to witness some of it. Yeah, really it's struggling that. with that, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's going to impact everything because you're walking around with this self inflicted label of I'm a terrible person. Um, and really, you look at them, and, and my interactions with them is, they are wonderful people. They are they're they're hardworking. They're they're doing their best. You know, uh, they're certainly struggling, and aren't we all yeah. in a lot of different ways? Yeah. Um, and so, to help people to open their eyes to that um, uh, is is part of the fulfilling piece of this oh, yeah. for them to start to look at it differently and say, oh, I'm not as bad as I thought I was, yeah. or I'm not bad at all. I'm just struggling, yeah. and that's okay. Other people struggle too. We are all struggling with lots of things. Yeah. I think that's why I love working with sexual concerns in a group setting, because often yeah. when I first start a group, people don't make eye contact. They're like, I can't believe I'm here. There's just so much shame. And then within that first meeting or a couple of weeks, it's like, wait, these are good people here too. Maybe I'm yeah. a good person or okay yeah. too. I just in group therapy in general to hear other people's story and say, I'm struggling too. Oh my goodness, that sounds just like my struggle. Yeah. Or that's totally different, but I totally get it. Yeah, and you're not um, awful. No, maybe I'm okay. It's quite the opposite. It ends up being this really bonding experience of, oh, I really like hearing from you. Yeah. I, I like coming to group and yep. hearing what you have to say, and uh, yeah, it opens their eyes to the fact of, oh, maybe I'm not as bad as I thought I was. Yep. and that's a big part of the treatment, I think. Absolutely. Because you mentioned a big piece where it's like. I feel like a terrible person, so the result of that is I'm going to withdraw, pull back. And for me, that disconnection with people is what maintains things like I want a pornography viewing. And connection or intimacy is the antidote. And yet what seems to get in the way is like, I can't talk to people about this concern because there's so many like catastrophic messages about what it means to struggle with yeah. pornography that really gets in the way with connecting and sharing your story. And that's where I think particularly in intimate relationships, the whole addiction idea gets in the way because it's, I have to eradicate, eradicate the addiction. I need to stop being sexually aroused by all these images that I'm watching. 
Um, whereas if you're trying to form a close bond, particularly you know, um, in a marriage, for example, where sexual intimacy is part of the relationship, well, that's not going to just go away. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to. Um, and, and so making that a part of our interactions with people, and it doesn't have to be an explicit, you know, sexual encounter with people. It's just understanding that um, I enjoy being around people mm. and I can be me and I might have thoughts that go lots of different directions mm -hmm. and that's okay. It's not who I am. I can be me and, and in relationship with you mm. and that can be a very fulfilling relationship. So you're talking about relationships in general with friends, oh, yeah. family, on all, colleagues, on all levels. partners, yeah. but just human connection, being authentic is going to be helpful for somebody. Yeah. I mean, people get these, these worries. I, I, I view porn and so I'm going to, I can't be around children because who yeah. knows what I might do. Oh, that one breaks my heart. Yeah, yeah. it's like you are oh. the farthest away from doing yeah. that of anyone I've ever met because yeah. you're so concerned about it. And that's what I often tell people is, you are so worried about this that I have no worries that you'll right. ever do that because you're going to stop yourself before you even get close yep. to it. Um, so that brings up another issue for me is um, we both work with couples. So this can be a, a pretty big thing in a couple dynamic. And yeah. I've worked with couples where the one partner is viewing and they say, you know, we can't have children because I don't want to harm my children. And it's like, are you looking at child pornography? It's like, no. And it's like, it's not how this works. It doesn't right. progress to aggressive behaviors or molesting children. Yeah, not at all. Research is pretty clear that that's, it's not a cause um, in that. And so, um, yeah, but again, what, what, that, what that is, what you just described is people are now restricting their life because I view pornography. And I can't be doing all these things that I find fulfilling I really and I want, want to yeah. have as part of my life, I can't have them because I view porn. And that just makes the distress so much higher. And then you cope with that by? By viewing pornography because that's the only thing that actually relieves the distress momentarily. Or at least that's the only way I've learned how to do it. Yeah. And, and so putting those things back in give a person a much greater chance of overcoming the struggle because um, then my life is headed in the direction I want to. I'm already taking the steps I need to to be heading where I want to go. And that's that values piece. Yeah. Of I'm doing the things that I value that make my life fulfilling. Well, that's going to lower distress in and of itself. Yeah. So now I don't have to be viewing pornography to feel better. You don't need to self-soothe if your life's where you want it. It's good. And there's, you know, there's natural distress that comes with that. Lifestyle. You're going to have kids. You're going to have stress in your life. You would know about that. I would know about yeah. that. Yeah, we've got a few. <laughs> um, and so that comes with it, but it's, a, it's, it's with a purpose. Yeah, yeah. It has direction to it, and that makes all the difference. Yeah. So since we both work with couples, um, I've worked with partners. So their partners viewing porn. And and they're struggling with that because often there's an impact of like, you know, if I was more or more attractive or did whatever in the bedroom, this wouldn't be happening. And, and I mean, that's heartbreaking to see that too, to see a partner really impacted. Yeah. And I want to work to convey that, you know, your partner's struggling with pornography, but it's not a sexual concern. It, this is an emotional concern. Absolutely. But often for the other part that's not viewing, it's perceived as this is a sexual concern and I'm how somehow deficit or inadequate. What would you say to a partner who their partner's viewing? Yeah. What would you say to help them understand what's it's, going it's on? It's hard to get this message across because of that, because there's so much in of that. There could be that self-blame or, or, or it's totally blamed at the partner. He's doing this terrible thing. It's usually a he. His issue. <laughs> um, it's his issue and he needs to solve this because it's ruining our marriage. Yeah. And so there's just blaming going on. What, what I find that, that dissolves that um, is when a partner can really approach this struggle with an understanding of what you just said. This is not a sexual concern so much as it is an emotional concern. Mm -hmm. When we can be understanding of our partner's emotional functioning, that we have that intimate bond where if he's struggling or I'm struggling, we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. That's scary, and though. It's like, extremely scary. Oh yes, that's so. That's so. Such a vulnerable position to yeah. take. 
But when we can do that, that's when healing happens. Yeah. Um, healing in a relationship and healing personally. When we can approach someone with the understanding that they're going to accept me just the way I am. Ooh. That it's shame hard. goes away. Yeah, there's nothing to be ashamed there's about. Nothing. Because now it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'm acceptable to that person. They don't have to like what I'm doing. But again, that's the idea. Of, I don't have to accept that, have that behavior be yeah. acceptable. Um, but I can accept you as a person because you matter to me. And so that understanding, I think, is a key piece. And then patience. Hmm. Recognizing that this struggle may not just be overcome quickly. Yeah. It might take a little while. And it probably predated the relationship. Most, most often. It's been there for years. Most often, that's the case. I, most of the time I see people, they started this as a teenager. Yeah. Or younger. Yeah. I've got people like, yeah, I was 11 years old. Yep. That's when it started for me. And uh, you know, I've had periods where I thought it was gone and I was over it. It always, and I always turn back to it, and that's really frustrating for yeah. them. So, yeah, it often has nothing to do with the partner because it predates the relationship, mm -hmm. and it's really about trying to deal with these difficult emotions that I just never learned how to deal with in a more effective way. So I need your help with that piece. So you mentioned it starts really young, you've got kids. How do you teach your kids about sexuality or pornography to help them earlier on so they don't come to our office when they get to college and are struggling? How do you help them as a parent? You know, I've got, I've got a great, let me give you an illustration from when I was younger. Um, so I was doing a little, I was doing a report for an art class. And I was looking up, and I think I was doing Edward Manet. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got some, some nude paintings. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of his most famous is a nude woman. And I was typing the report, and I had the book open uh, next to me, working on a computer. My dad walks by, and he just takes a look, and he says, oh, that's a little pornographic. Huh. And I think I was 12, maybe 13 at the time, and I just hadn't put that label on it. Really? There was no judgment I just, to it? It was art. I might have huh. even said that to my dad. Like, this is art, Dad. <laughs> Looks a little pornographic <laughs> to me. He just called it what it was. Yeah. It, he said it totally nonchalantly. Yeah. And, he, and, he, and he moved on. He didn't yeah. even tell me to close the book. <laughs> he's just like, that oh, looks a little pornographic. Yeah. And I was just like, I think he's right. <laughs> no wonder I, you know, keep turning back to that page <laughs> as a 13 year old. You know, and it's just, it was a realization of, oh, I'm attracted to looking at this picture. Huh. And that doesn't fit with my values to keep staring in. You know, and and you know, just turning back to it, hmm. and and so it was, it was that kind of a conversation of calling it what it was, okay? This, you know, if that's pornography or, you know, yeah, that's has to do with sex. Hmm. You know, having those conversations of labeling, uh, you know, sexual things by what they are. Hmm. Um, so I think as as a parent, uh, my wife and I are, are very aware of. You know, labeling our body parts is what they are. Just using the correct terms um, so that it's not a shameful thing to talk mm -hmm. about. It's, oh, there's something going wrong with your penis. Mm -hmm. Okay. This well, is my elbow. This, this is, is a penis. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a body part. It has a function. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. um, it has a specific purpose in your overall functioning. And so we have those everyday nonchalant conversations about it mm. and sexual things are part of those conversations. So you're never going to sit your kid down and have the talk? No, it's going to be multiple talks over multiple years. You're having the conversation? The, the conversation is going on yeah. um, and it's re they're, they're short little snippets um, and I think you know when we weave those into where sex is a part of a close intimate relationship um, my older kids I've got a two-year-old, so he's not aware of much yeah. at all. Um, but my, my older kids have got teenagers, and they've already connected that mom and dad have sex. Mm -hmm. It's part of our relationship. They know. We don't have to say much about that. It, it's enough conversation where they, they know what that's about. You know, we don't have to go into the details of it mm -hmm. with them. It's little pieces here and there yeah. that they build on that. It sounds like you make it pretty normal. You'll talk about it as is. It's not a scary thing. Yeah. Or little terms come up. What does that mean? Well, 
that's you know has to do with has, has to do with sex in this way. Yeah, that's what that means. Yeah. just labeling it what it is is really helpful. Well, Matt, the only problem I see is we might go out of business if you keep like having good, healthy talks about sexuality with your kids, which I is my goal. I would be okay with that. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Then we can do something else more exciting. That's actually my dream, to never have to work with unwanted pornography concerns again. Because we just talk about sexuality and we normalize it and have people understand we focus it. on other things. But we're not quite there yet. No, we're not. Um, so if you could do like a public service announcement for pornography, because we've got a few states passing legislation that it's an epidemic, what would your public service announcement be about porn? Um, uh, that's a good question. On the spot, campaign. Not, not much of an announcer <laughs> on things. Um, I, I think my overall message would be um, to create that understanding. You know, let's let's understand what's actually going on here. Um, I don't think it's as much of an epidemic um, in the terms of this is not a disease that needs to be eradicated. Mm. When people struggle with pornography, it's an emotional concern. Yeah. And the goal is not to eradicate emotions. Life's pretty wonderful with emotions. Yeah. It's pretty wonderful with sex too. Yeah. <laughs> and and so it's not about getting rid of that. Epidemic means we got to get rid of something. Oh yeah. And so I don't like the terminology more than anything. So let's understand what's really going on here, and let's understand ourselves. Let's understand ourselves in relation to other people, and that way I can choose how I want to relate. Mm. With people in a way that's meaningful and fulfilling mm. for me. So let's let's create meaningful and fulfilling relationships. Mm. Pornography doesn't have to get in the way of that if we don't let it. Mm. It can if we let it. Mm. And it's more of when we try and hide and and change the things about us that we don't have much control over. Yeah. I like that because I think when I hear epidemic or addiction, I mean fear comes up, powerlessness, and I think. If this is an emotional concern that's going to feed into that, but Absolutely. we were talking about it. It's like, let, let's have a conversation and understand it. You know, if the emotional alarm bells go down, we're just going to need less of a need to kind of soothe ourselves. Yeah, and I think one of the driving emotions of that is shame. Yeah. You know, if it's an epidemic and I'm infected, Ooh. you I, better hide. I better hide. Yeah. Uh, people can't know that because people have opinions about that. People are saying that this is a terrible, awful thing, and I'm doing it. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it, and I don't, certainly don't want to infect other people. Yeah. So that makes me, again, need to run and hide. And so yeah. that shame is a really difficult emotion that's tied up in this, as well as other emotional yeah. concerns. And so the conversations break that down. Yeah. And we can just say, you know what, it's okay that you're struggling with this. Let's talk about it. Let's, yeah. let's come to understand that struggle a little better so that we can do something about it where it's not as much of a struggle for you. Like it. Very safely, very gently. Yeah. Like these are good people. Good people. Like we don't have to look at it as you're infected so your life is totally off base. Smart. In fact, that brings up another thought. Like, I often wonder if that kind-hearted, sensitive person trying to do the right thing and not hurt anybody is actually a risk factor for developing struggles with pornography. I. I Anecdotally, I would say, yeah. Um, um, but I've also, you know, there's a wide variation yeah, there. Yeah, that's not everybody. For sure, it's certainly not everybody, but someone that really is, is mindful of how they're affected, you know, how their, their thought patterns seem to always gravitate toward pornography. But they're really concerned about not disrupting other people. Well, they're going to be more likely to pull back. Yeah because I don't want to affect other people negatively. So I, I, that kind-heartedness might lead to some of yeah. that. Very well-intentioned and causes a little more suffering for that person. Yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed chatting with you. We get to chat about this quite a bit because yeah, uh, we, we work with this a lot. Uh, maybe my last question is, um, if you knew someone was struggling and maybe considering seeking help or working on this issue, because a lot of people struggle on their own for a long time. What would be your words of encouragement to like get started? You know, I, I like to put it in the context of um, your life is in 
your hands in terms of heading in the direction that you want to go in. And so do something kind for yourself mm -hmm. to head in the direction that you want to go. If that's seeking out a professional to get a little more assistance because you haven't figured things out on your own, go for it. Mm -hmm. if, if that's, you know, starting to do some new things that matter rather than leaving those out, start there. Yeah. You know, do that kind thing for yourself to start to head in the right direction because when we do that, then our life is filled with more fulfilling, meaningful feelings as well as things we can really hold on to. And that makes our relationships richer. Mm. It just affects everything. And so taking those small little changes, you know, committing to ourselves, I'm gonna do something different. And it's more about adding in the stuff that matters yeah. rather than trying to wholesale get rid of all the stuff yeah. that I don't want. What a mindset shift. So of trying to get rid of something, say, no, let's start doing yeah. things that are meaningful in your life. Yeah, I, I think, you know, just a, a microcosm of that is I can't think about pornography, got to get rid of that. Well, our minds don't work that yeah. way. You know, subtraction just is not a function of our mind. But if I can add in the things that matter, that are fulfilling and valuable to me, there's less room for all the other stuff. I like that. So I mean, that's a good place to start instead of like, this is going to be an awful, terrible undertaking. Really, the pathway is we're going to actually start doing things that are more meaningful, fulfilling for you. Absolutely. And the life you want is, is closer than you think. And not as far off. It's really not. And that's when I want to work with people. It's like, this is not going to be a, a really <coughs> long process. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Often we uncover other things. We're like, yeah, there's a trauma history or attachment concerns. But for many, it's like it's reorienting you to let's start living your life now. Actually, there's a lot of really good workable things. Absolutely. Sometimes it's just a matter of pivoting to just a more workable direction. Yeah. It's not that off, just, you know, just a degree that or far. two change. That, and then the long run makes a big difference yeah. over time. Yep. Well, thank you, Matt. I appreciate this. We might have to have you back because um, you work a lot with sexual concerns and our, our resident acceptance and commitment therapy professional. So thank you for taking some time today to to educate those more about helpful ways to talk about pornography. Well, thank you. This was fun. Wonderful.